uh, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this lecture. Um, Carol Jacobi uh, is a curator of British art at um, Tate Britain. Um, she's worked as a curator, a writer, and lecturer. And I shall mention very briefly a few of her last projects uh, that are related to uh, modern, modern painting mainly. Um, so we shall mention British art in the nuclear edge in 2014, Francis Bacon, Paris, Monaco at the Côte d'Azur, an exhibition um, presented in 2016, um, a publication on related to tonight's subject uh, on which I will say a few words. Um, so a publication called Pablo Picasso, Portraits of Isabel Rothorn, published in the Burlington Magazine in 2019. And more recently, um, Carol Jacobi created a show called Van Gogh and Britain in 2019. Tonight's lecture will um, be a presentation of which I must say I'm very enthusiastic about on uh, this fantastic character painter, Isabel Rothorn. Um, it's called A une passante, Isabel Rothorn, modern painter. And I must say that the title says much about uh, what is at stake here. That is um, Isabel, as you might know, um, was an intimate of uh, many great painters such as Giacometti, Picasso, Derain, Bacon, and some writers such as Leris of Peter Rose Pulham, uh, among others, of course. But uh, in the uh, pages of the books on art history, she mostly remains in this category of muse, of friend, of, and is barely mentioned as a painter. Carol Jacobi um, pursued a very patient uh, for, uh, I think, uh, patient research. I think it's, it lasted more than uh, uh, almost eight years on um, Isabel uh, Rothon. And uh, she managed to um, gather what is, uh, I believe, the first very, um, the very first uh, serious monograph on this painter. And uh, the book, uh, called Out of the Cage, the Art of Isabel Rothon, she's, um, she's written, uh, will be published in February uh, 2021. So I'm very happy and proud to um, uh, allow her to make this presentation on um, Isabel Rothon's painting and uh, on her contribution. So thank you very much, Carol, for uh, your work and for accepting this lecture that we're doing live uh, on, um, on this platform. Um, so I believe uh, now it's up to you to talk about uh, Isabel. Thank you, Carol. And thank you very much, Hugo. It's wonderful to be talking about Isabel Walsthorne in Paris, even if it's virtually, she'd have absolutely loved that. And especially to be talking at the School of Modernities um, and the Foundation. Um, we'll have a chance for discussion and questions uh, at the end, but please um, can I welcome you all and also ask you, you know, do, do add um, comments or questions to the chat as we go along. So I'm going to begin, um, I'm going to begin by letting um, the artist uh, introduce herself um, through a work. And so I'm beginning uh, at the end. Um, the painting, um, this painting Sparrowhawk um, was discovered on Isabel Rawlsthorne's easel uh, in her studio after she died at 89 in January, 1992. She worked in her cottage in the winter months, so it must have been made the previous summer, if not before. Rawlsthorne studied natural history all her life and was familiar with sparrowhawks around her home in rural Essex. And, and I want to show you how uh, their, their rounded wings give them a sort of, sort of ghostly quality. Uh, it allows them to pass um, through um, branches um, and sort of appear over their um, prey very unexpectedly and this this sort of just this couple this couple of few seconds of film um, shows you the sort of spectral effect sorry just to make it play there we go.
so this grossly um, effect, um, sort of, I think, is some picked up in the paintings, um, in that the viewpoint is from below, as the, though the bird was appearing above us. And I think at the end of her life, Rawson chose the sparrowhawk to represent the coming of death. Um, death is present in a second sense, in that the bird itself is death and part dead and part skeleton. In the 1960s, Rawson became an early activist against the ills of industrial farming and pesticides, stubble burning, the removal of hedges and so on was decimating wildlife um, in her area. And her work featured the carcasses of birds and animals that she found in the fields. Um, as they decayed, um, they became more linear, more succinct, uh, in a way she liked. They sort of became, in a way, more like drawings of themselves. And this sparrowhawk was found near her easel. So this dead alive ambiguity, each revealing the other, is part of how Rawson's paintings work as a play of ideas around a motif which is not resolved. What Walter Benjamin called a dialectical optic, uh, what the poet Fran Francis Ponge called, um, termed objet, objet um, sort of roughly translated as, as a sort of object game. And Rawson was a contemporary of both men when they were publishing in Paris in the 30s and 40s. She knew Ponge and almost certainly her path crossed with Benjamin, not least because they were both habitués of the Café de la Régence. So the dialectical op optic also had an element of past present, uh, as Isabel liked to call it. Um, in this case, um, the hawk had associations with death of an ancient kind, and notably Egyptian imagery of Horus. The rainbow wings of Sparrowhawk also allude to a late work by another artist considering the end of their life, um, J.M.W. Turner's Angel Standing in the Sun. And in the foreground, turn embedded figures representing love in all its aspects, not necessarily romantic. Adam and Eve discover the body of Abel, and Judith beheads Holophanes. Instead, Rawson has inscribed into her paint the names of people she loved. This is hard to see on a slide, but you may be able to make out Louis, um, the poet Louis Magnis, Louise, the gallerist Louise Lyris, Durand, the artist André Durand, and Alberto Giacometti, amongst others. She also left a trace of herself, uh, a, a tremulous set of marks that you can see on the other side of the painting, um, in charcoal, which both represent and enact the movement of her own hand as she makes the picture. And, and this is a close-up. So, I have been working on Rawson for 15 years um, since I was shown this picture and many others um, by their custodian. A, a catalogue compiled by Biddy Noakes and Suzanne Doyle for Rawson's retrospective in 1997 and a piece by Martin Harris Harrison in his catalogue Transition the London Art Scene in the 50s with the only text on her work until 2007 when the Giacometti Foundation published correspondence between Rawson and, and Giacometti. In 2008, I was fortunate to secure a Leverhulme Fellowship at the National Portrait Gallery in London to look at Rawson's portraits, which eventually led to the book um, coming out in February, which is being published by the estate of Francis Bacon and Thames and Hudson, and which has been supported by her custodian, her family, the estate of Francis Bacon, the Francis Bacon MB Art Foundation, and the Giacometti Foundation, and many, many other professional favours and kindnesses. When Wilson was in her, her 70s, she herself wrote her story. Although she could be startlingly direct about her short relationship with George and uh, Diane Bataille, for instance, its style was self-espacing and it was unembellished by kiss and tell tales that might affect anyone living, such as Bacon or the family of Giacometti. So it was not published. Today I will follow her lead. I will focus on her career and, in the time I have, give you a glimpse of a small part of her work and her thinking around art as they evolved over 80 years. So now I will go chronologically. Um, none of um, Rawthorne's youthful work has been traced, so I'll put up this slide of two later paintings, um, which were favourites of hers, for a few minutes while I talk uh, about this youthful, youthful period. Isabel Walsall was born Isabel Nicholas in East End, London in 1912. 
And her interest in art began in the National Gallery and the Victoria and Albert Museum and her love of natural history in Kew Gardens, uh, where she began drawing and, and London Zoo. Her father, a merchant seaman, had been a, was a keen naturalist, brought birds and animals back from his voyages for donation to London Zoo and others. And Rossall wrote, I grew up thinking it was normal to hear scratching grunts and scraping noises during the night, to have alligators in the bath, snakes in bundles of straw. She spent her teenage years in Liverpool. She was uncomfortable at school and often escaped to roam, sketch and swim in the sea on her own. She won the drawing prize, however, and at 16, she enrolled at Liverpool School of Art, where she was very happy. She was encouraged in her study of animals and finally able to draw and paint from the human model. Walsall moved out from her home and began a life lived on her own terms, authentically, experimentally, considering from first principles, her frequently expressed, expressed question, how to live. Three aspects of art school life were to have long-term significance. And I want to pause a bit to sort of um, spend a time, bit of time with this. Firstly, the principal, um, Henry Huggle, was an early adopter of slides to teach the history of art. And he defaced them with lines to comment on them. And Rawson would build on this. Her knowledge of other artists would become exceptional and she would always use reproductions and photographs as aids to her work. Rawson's favorite course was perspective where the students were taught how, to how a network of perspective lines converging on an object could make it body forth at the center of a large piece of paper. And she was one of a group of students who called themselves the thinkers after the rebels in the film of the moment, Metropolis. They began to think of observation and drawing as a more embodied phenomenon in the world rather than observing from an emotional and physical distance. And one of the group, William Stevenson, recalled in later years that perspective required a capacity for feeling. I had to become the element I wished to draw. You're part and parcel of the essence of what you're involved in. The thinkers' ideas were inspired by the writings of Walter Sickert. Sickert appealed to this generation in his non-elitist vision, his embrace of popular imagery, photographs or films, for instance. He saw drawing as a phenomenological inquiry. Embodied perspective was intrinsic to drawing and drawing was intrinsic to art. And these convictions would inform Rawson's vision and that of artists with whom she became into contact. The thinkers took this idea further in their approach to life study. They rented a cheap room where they, men and women, posed naked for each other after classes in the evening. This broke the school's rule, rules, which only allowed female students to draw from draped, draped models more importantly, the initiative dismantled the traditional binary of artist and model with its underlying binary of man and woman and the, objectif the objectification that went with it. Artist was model, a model was artist, as, George, as William Stevenson said, part and parcel of the essence of what you were involved in. Wilson's father died before he could see her win her life drawing scholarship to the Royal Academy in London. And the family could not fund her studies but she went anyway. She loved London, always an autodidact. She spent a great deal of time in the museums and parks, visiting her father's animals in the zoo and long walks through the cities. And scholars have claimed that there could never be a woman flaneur, but Rawson was one of many and used this word to describe herself. She found the RA itself a dilettante institution and she missed her thinkers. The traditional demarcation between artist and model thwarted her efforts to earn a living by posing. No one would let her do both, and she left. She needed a studio, she, 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 so she called on Jacob Epstein. The, scu the sculpture Epstein was the most controversial sculptor of his day, at odds with the Academy, always in the papers. He accepted Rawlsthorne as a model and an artist, and she moved in with him and his wife Margaret as, studio, as his studio assistant. Walsall did not do much posing, is a revealing that their arrangement only resulted in three works by Epstein, one arguably his most powerful portrait. While within a year she had, was having her first solo show of animal drawings just off Bond Street, it sold out and she was 19. The exhibition, the exhibition also gained a lot of publicity. The Times newspaper gave it first place among the smaller exhibitions that season, asserting in a perceptive echo of a thinker's philosophy Miss Nicholas feels and not merely observes what she draws. 
That summer, Epstein took up Ross Thorne's medium of watercolour and they both had success with vibrant landscapes and flowers painted together in Epping Forest in 1933. Ross Thorne showed hers alongside avant-garde men at the Red Fern Gallery. And the papers declared, at first sight, one would have attributed the man's work to the woman, so delicate, sensitive, almost shy are those of Mr. Jowett, that's Percy Jowett, um, head of Chelsea School of Art. So bo um, abounding, bold and luxuriant, those of Miss Nicholas. So Wilson was by now a national celebrity as model and artist. It is strange, therefore, that she made no mention of these successes in her autobiography. In fact, I think until recently, they haven't, it hasn't been known at all. Her, her, her autobiography just states simply that she left London for Paris and never saw Epstein again. Now, in fact, her sudden de departure followed the birth in September 1934 of her and Epstein's son. He was named Jacob after his father, or Jackie, and Rawson allowed or was coerced into letting him and Margaret raise the baby as their own. He had a good life. He became a racing driver, in fact. Um, but she never gave away their secret and she never saw her child again. Now, two weeks after the birth, someone arranged a flight to Paris um, and booked her into the Hotel de Londres, but just behind the Cafe du Dôme. Paris had always been Wilson's mecca, as she put it, but she was desolate. She had lost her child, her professional name, her home, her studio and her lover. And she wrote that the early days in Paris had a profound effect, which is with me today. And I think we can see um, here the first evidence of Orson's tendency to deal with deep emotional crises in private, almost as though they were happening to someone else. And here also being this strange division in her persona between the determined gaiety and verve of the public person and a clear-eyed melancholy revealed in her art. Paris was a transformative experience. Orson took long walks through the city and continued to make landscape and animal studies but she concentrated on the figure, studying at the Académie de la Grande Chaumière. My French was very poor, she recalled. I can empathize with this. I was shy of speaking. I decided that to read a daily newspaper would help me. I knew that soon I would be forced to speak. She was befriended by André Derrin, um, who had become a lifelong, um, a, a lifelong um, confidant. Uh, he, he, he made six portraits of her, and he also introduced her to the Paris art scene. She fell in with left bank circles, especially those orientated towards figuration and dissident surrealism, Balthus, Tristan Zara, Pablo Picasso, who also made three portraits, Paul Eluard, Talcott, Francis Gruber, and Giacometti. And I think Giacometti was her most important, sorry, I'm just showing you um, Deran's um, beautiful portrait, one of Deran's beautiful portraits of um, Wilson. I think Giacometti was her most important artistic and personal relationship. They met in 1935, and despite their separation during the war and their respective marriages, they influenced each other until his death in 1966, and in Rothman's case, long after. The only language they shared was rudimentary French. And she enjoyed his arguments with Zara and others at the Dome, and alone they visited galleries, museums, Rodin's foundry, and took long walks at night. Um, this practice is often mistakenly thought to have begun for Giacometti later with the playwright Samuel Beckett. Their friendship coincided with Giacometti's unpopular but defiant new beginning, a sort of commitment to research, drawing and working for the model, which was in sympathy with Rothschild's ideas. And Veronique Wessinger has noticed how Giacometti's second walking woman appears to have incorporated observations from Rothschild's appearance when it was reworked around this time suggesting he was already, she was already sitting for him or um, present in his studio. And you can see that the breasts uh, in the second version are no longer symmetrical, symmetrical mounds. Uh, they fall with their own weight. The transition from the thigh to the hip is no longer a mannequin joint and the step is more buoyant. Giacometti also began the first of two heads. And I think Wilson was the model that looked back and that together she and Giacometti sort of continued the Liverpool experiment and broke down the traditional demarcations between model and artist. And um, neither ever departed from the practice of making portraits of friends and lovers, uh, just a small number that could be informed by thought and association as well as appearance. 
Wilson had her own study, um, but this rare cell portrait may have been made in Giacometti's around the same time. The distance from the mirror, the shadow on the wall behind, the edge of what appears to be a bed and the angle of the sketchbook are like Giacometti's own earlier self-portrait. At the same time, it borrows the hieratic presence of Van Eyck's St. Barbara. The folds of fabric provide a kind of internal scaffolding that stands in for perspectival, perspectival, perspectival lines uh, and sort of places the figure. And I think this is what appealed to Rawson about this um, work, although she had actually seen the original um, when she was a child. Um, Rawson and Jacqueline shared their enthusiasm for early Renaissance art, and she kept this reproduction in her studio all her life. Giacometti admired Rawson's drawing and their conversations may have contributed to his quite sudden move in the 1930s uh, in his drawing and his sculpture from surface facets to a more an active analysis of inner structures. Rawson herself was ready to experiment with oils, learning technique from Durand and Balthas and preparing a painting of her friend and model Mara Sherbatov walking through the city. This is the only pre-war work outside of sketchbooks known to have uh, survived, um, probably kept because of Wolfson's very close relationship with Sherbatov. She never made the painting, however, and events intervened, and it would be over a decade before she had a chance to realise the idea. A refugee from Russia, Sherbatov was a linguist and personal assistant to Sefton Delma, foreign correspondent of the English newspaper, The Daily Express. And he had befriended Rawlsthorn soon after she arrived in Paris. Sherbatov and Rawlsthorn both lived with Delma at his apartment in the Place Vendôme. And Delma claimed to have fallen in love with Rawlsthorn even before he met her when he saw Epstein's sculpture in the Tate Gallery. Um, and they, they did marry in 1936. Rawlsthorn assisted um, Delma in his intelligence, in his intelligence gathering in the run up to the war. Um, at parties in his black and mirrored apartment and on assignments. So she saw the remilitarization of the Rhine Rhineland and the invasion of Czechoslovakia posing as his assistant. The outbreak of the Spanish Civil War, during which they were captured on the first day, pretending to be holiday makers, and they were traveling uh, with paints, picnic basket, and a pet kitten. And the bombing of Barcelona, she saw as a courier. In Paris, she and Sherbatov helped volunteer, volunteers um, and refugees in the Civil War, which was an imprisonable offence. And the outbreak of World War II found Warsaw in Warsaw. It is in this context, uh, the context of these sort of restless times and Warsaw's restless and dangerous travel in the later 1930s, when she and Giacometti were often apart, that they began the intimate correspondence and he became attached to a memory of her walking in the Boulevard Saint-Germain. He began a series of full figure portraits, um, but, her, but her presence eluded him. And famously, the sculptures became smaller to appear more distant and effects of remoteness, indistinctness and relative scale were wended in light and shadow relief, whittled into the form and some crumbled altogether. And I like Reinhold, uh, Reinhold Hull's description as he remembered her at parting, the way she appeared in the artist's field of vision, as she walked away, she slowly shrank to a thin line, a tiny spot among the myriad details of the street. And even though he saw progressively less form, shape and colour and the details dissolved, the tiny unform kept its full potency of meaning and undiminished existence for the person seeing it. This was something he had to express in art. So these Isabels were departing and arriving, having the quality of an apparition or appearing. Like the Sparrowhawk, they have their dialectical optic. Walter Benjamin, a refugee from Germany, had made the walking figure the motif of modern times, paying special attention to Baudelaire's sonnet poem, At un passant, or to a passerby. It is about a glance exchanged in the street between the poet and a widow, described as an as inspiration, a convulsion, a, a flash. Benjamin interpreted the widow as a figure of shock, indeed of cat catastrophe, as he said. He extrapolated this into a model of modern subjectivity, citing his contemporary, the writer Paul Valéry, the impressions and sense perceptions of man actually be belong to the category of surprises. 
And Benjamin's updating of Baudelaire for his own insecure times provides an interesting context, I think, for Giacometti and Rawlsthorne's walking figures. Sherbatov for Rawlsthorne and Rawlsthorne for Giacometti were figures of catastrophe of this kind. They image the term fugitive beauty of Baudelaire's poem. The modern subject as passerby, displaced and in mourning for a lost moment or thing. Like many artists, the war reinforced Rawls, forced Rawlsthorne back to Britain and she and Giacometti were separated. They buried their work and, and she fled Paris as the Germans approached, writing desperately to tell him to get rid of his camera in case he was arrested as a spy. When he regained Switzerland, Giacometti um, made a large, his first large sculpture of Rawlsthorne as the prophetess of Aeschylus' play Agamemnon, Cassandra, captured in, in war and brought to Agamemnon's palace on a cart, which he called the chariot. Rawlsthorne spent years in a secret house working for the special operations executive a branch, in a branch of British intelligence dealing with black propaganda. She created so-called malingering leaflets, which were instructions on faking illness distributed to enemy tr troops by the resistance. And actually Sherbatov was working for the resistance at this point. She also made subversive pornography and she edited a newspaper for German soldiers. After D-Day, when the punishing hours and very dark content that she was dealing with had taken their toll, she left to edit a magazine for liberated Italy. But by May 1945, only a month after V-Day, she managed to get back to Paris as a radio correspondent. And as, as far as I know, she's the first British artist back in Paris that wasn't um, with the forces. Sherbatov had left for New York and her friends were changed or still away, but she was reunited with Giacometti in September. Wilson stayed in France for two more difficult but very important years. Her first principles approach to how to live, an idea as a mark making as phenomenological inquiry and of the artist as part and parcel of the essence of what you were involved in, found fellow feeling in the existentialist circle of Albert Camus, Simone de Beauvoir and Jean Paul Sartre, and the journals Les Temps Modernes and Horizon, and, particular, and in particular new friendships with the philosophers Maurice Merleau-Ponty and A.J. Eyre, and with Louise and Michel Lyris, George and Diane Bataille. However, since Rawson had lost her Paris studio in 1936, she had spent a decade painting in temporary spaces, occasionally a borrowed studio, mainly bedrooms and hotel rooms. She had, she had had no models and confined herself to collecting and studying small animals and birds. Although she and Giacometti were finding living together and he was delighted to have her sitting for him again, she had nowhere to work. Neither Rawlsthorne nor Giacometti had exhibited anything new for 10 years and both were desperate to make up for lost time, but his obsessive timetable suffocated in her word, hers. After only months, she moved into Georges Bataille's vacated department with the avant-garde musician René Leibovitz, planning a less distracting life in the country. But she had not really recovered from the war, I don't think, and her hopes did not work out. Eventually, she fled to a tiny cottage in Indre in the French rural interior, where she froze through the famous cold winter of 1946. And there, Rawson thought about suicide, and she read Aeschylus and Job, and began a diary and painted. In a manner of, of, of Pons, Pons's poetry of things, she painted natural objects, mused over and made strange by their lighting and arrangement. And this one, Green Woodpecker, is the last of four pictures she made of a bird that she found frozen, which may have been in her mind, I think, um, when she painted Sparrowhawk 45 years later. You can see from the directional brushstroke she had been thinking about Van Gogh, I think, as an artist as well um, as a person. And the arrangement, apparently slung over a drawing board propped on a windowsill, recalls the sacrificial effect of Soutine's inverted carcasses. But like Sparrowhawk, the open wings give a paradoxical sense of life in death, flight in falling. And I think this picture distills Rawthorne's careful, very careful selection of motifs throughout her career um, that went along with this objure. The species had a reputation as an oracle going back to classical times, the sort of forecaster of war, 
And I think the noisy bird silent state matched Rawson's solitude and the lost sense of self, as she put it. The frozen body against the snowy ground expanded her idea of the future as quote, a terrifying blank to a general one, standing for the emergence of Europe under snow that year. And the unnaturally extreme winter was experienced by many as a bleak introduction to the new Cold War. And the woodpecker, predicting nothing, provides a kind of nature more for the uncertain nuclear era. This open-ended dialectical optic, optic around a rigorously but ultimately ex elusive realism would remain characteristic of Rawson's work. She was still unwell when she returned to Paris and she continued her diary and it is a fascinating document tracing a period she's fiercely full of ideas, stimulated by everything that was going on, but nearly despairing. Wilson was part of the craze for calligraphy, the spontaneous mark, the hazard of the hand, the gesture of the artist that impacts the observer body to body. This love of line can be seen in, this, in the doodle of her friend, Patty Whitney, Whitney Smith, that she obviously did at a cafe table with her sort of letter writing pen. Wilson painted still lives and a, and a bird skeleton uh, bought from Derol. Um, in, her in, her, in her carcasses, uh, if her carcasses were likenesses of themselves, then the skeletons were kind of drawings. She continued to sit for Giacometti, but still had no portrait model of her own. Instead, she copied a reproduction of a Roman fresco, the baker Terentius and his wife. And here you can see a sort of lost, one of the lost paintings she made from it. She was particularly interested, as she had been with some Barbara, uh, in the presence of the couple. Um, here they were strengthened by um, devices older than conventional perspectives, such as the overlapping frame within a frame. She lent this re reproduction to Giacometti and terracotta hues and frames of the Roman four star can be seen in his work too. Balfour's promised to lend also on his studio, but the, but the promise was not, not realized. She worked and starved in cheap, cheap hotel rooms, watching as her colleagues have found patrons, models, recognition, and made things for new exhibitions. In one very untypical moment, she considered giving art up and wrote bitterly, so much better to have just been a pretty girl. Sorry, I should go back. In April, she sold some paintings in London, however, and she was offered some shows. And so she returned to England in September 1947. She married the composer Constant Lambert. No honeymoon, they both needed to work. And she immediately set up a north facing studio in their home in Camden Town, painting it with Roman four style panels. The next three years would be astonishingly productive. And within two, she had opened a solo exhibition at the most avant garde venue in the country, the Hanover Gallery. She, would finally, she could finally secure models and and she began a new version of her walking figure, informed by Giacometti's night and his city square, squares and by the landscapes of David Bomberg. She called it the desert. We see a woman advancing across an open bomb site across this opposite her studio window. It is kind of um, Becchetti and Leovard, lamps are unlit, a tree stands as a bear as a telegraph pole. A strip of horizon is barred by the spires of churches and a dome, which is probably the damaged National Gallery and dissected by scaffolding. And it's dark green at midday, as Rawson described it. The desert integrated the figure and ground in a dense network of strokes. Horizontals, orthogonals and repoussoirs are put down with a hazard of gesture rather than calculation, taking our eye from the tangibly damp and dirty surface of the camera canvas to the distant dome. Out of his, uh, uh, this atmosphere swim three birds, startled by the walking woman, each the merest smear of movement. The woman herself comprises little more. Three strokes set her striding, the furthest leg a scratch in the grey pavement, breasts two clots of impasto barely distinguishable from canvas slubs. Um, tw 20 years later, the splash reappears, the splash at her heels reappears in one of Francis Bacon's portraits of Rawsthorne. 
and I think it's probably refers to one of her favorite nursery rhymes which again deals with the theme of, of inundation Dr Foster went to Gloucester in a shower of rain he stepped in a puddle right up to his middle and never went there again in the months before her Hanover show Rose Thorne wrote confidently to Giacometti homage to sculpture homage to skeletons I feel completely obsessed this was Giacometti's word that she's quoting back to him. And I have a clear idea of what I want to succeed. Skeletons of birds, bats, mouse, fish. She abandoned the four star frames and mounted and closed the skeletons in a new kind of scaffolding, vitrines of glass cases, um, immersing them in, sub in substantial envelopes like the serried skeletons in the glass cases in Derol or in the gallery of paleontology and comparative anatomy in the Jardin de Plantes. By now she was after a calligraphy that was even more su sudden, apparitional. She told Giacometti, I cannot build paint little by little approaching a little closer every day to succeed in something more accurate and definitive because I would like the object on the canvas to be sudden as if the form was designed by breath, if you will. So the only process is to remove every night and begin every morning all over again. When she sent him photographs, he admired the light touch and Lyris's seminal Horizon article, Thoughts Around Alberta Giacometti, published later that year, identified a new phase in Giacometti's work in similar terms. Instead of the patiently elaborated work of art, we now have something which rises up suddenly and which is all the more evident for looking as though it was, has suddenly arrived. Wilson was a bilingual link um, between London and Paris culture. She had mentored the young Eduardo Paolozzi in Paris, introducing him to Giacometti, and in London continued her friendships with him, Francis Bacon, and many others. In 1950, the influential critic and curator David Sylvester paired London artists who were described as of an outstanding talent with Paris counterparts in an ambitious exhibition, London, Paris, New Trends in Painting and Sculpture. At the New Institute of Contemporary Arts, London was represented by Rawsthorne, Francis Bacon, Lucian Freud, John Craxton, and the St. Ives artist Peter Lanyon, with three sculptors, Robert Adams, Reg, Reg Butler, and Fred McWilliam. But Rawsthorne was impatient with artists who fell back on repetition, um, despite the advantages it afforded for developing an audience in a market. And she, she moved on from this success. It was very typical that she just left her dealer to, uh, to deal with the response to the show and immersed herself in new problems. She was evolving a more abridged apparitional vision, a distilled essence which she named quintessence. Following on from the desert, she made a series of paintings of night, becoming interested in a book about the lightless depths of the ocean and a collection of flash photographs of owls. Um, that her and she and Bacon and um, both um, were enthusiasts for. This one, Owl, is the only work to survive uh, for the series and it looks back to Green Woodpecker and forward to Sparrowhawk. Like Van Eyck's and Barbara and the, and the Baker and his wife, Rawsthorn found images that could, be, could stand in as preliminary sketches. Owl alludes to the left-hand bird in this, um, in this flash picture we see its, its intent eye, the intrusive highlight of the claw, the rat swinging from its beak, and the blurring of the wind feathers. But like Green Woodpecker, Wilson has moved the bird to the center of the image to add a sort of hieratic effect. And the owl's sudden arrival is complemented by a style that brings the image into sight in a correspondingly sudden apparitional way. The viewer's eyes at first bewildered by barely differentiated blues and umbers until it meets that of the predator. And I think the instant we recognize this, we apprehend as though we were the prey, the three soft beats of its wings through the, through the air. Owl appears to be related to a series of paintings of investig investigating the story of Leda ravished by Zeus in the form of a swamp. William Butler Yeats' poet, leader, evoked the brute blood of the air and begins with the line, a sudden blow, the great wings beating still. The leaders were part of a preoccupation with classical literature and especially Aeschylus that had been stimulated by a new critical assessment. William Bedell Stanford's book, Aeschylus in his style, a study in language and personality, 
which Rawthorne had read by 1947. Stanford was important because his translations revealed the raw, illogical, embodied and synesthetic aspects of Aeschylus' language. Rawthorne always kept a copy of Cassandra's speech to Apollo, um, the speech she, she delivered um, from the cart outside the palace of, of um, Agamemnon um, with her in her bag. And this perhaps um, dated from Giacometti's uh, conception of the chariot. This speech was a particular kind of allegory of art. In the play, Apollo gave Cassandra the power to prophesy, but cursed her to never be able to make her understood. And Stam Stamford equated this language of, quote, ambiguity, incoherence, dimness to modern painting. The idea of a language, a visual language that was eloquent, revelatory, compound, yet unformed, incoherent, and visceral rather than intellectual was a crucial one for Rawthorne and for Francis Bacon. Rawthorne realised these classical interests on a grand scale around this time in her first of many um, commissions to design for the ballet. Um, it was a decor um, for um, Tiresias, which was designed for the Festival of Britain, 1951. It's about a paradox, uh, Paradoxically, a blind seer, Tiresias, um, was like the desert, like leader, a mainstream motif among the avant-garde, the voice, for example, of T.S. Eliot's Wasteland. Lambert chose the narrative of Tiresias' transformation into a woman and back, and his punishment when he revealed to the gods that women's sexual pleasure far exceeded men. Wilson wanted to get away from polite classical texts and chose known motifs for a more raw, brute and erotic effect, with dancers apparently topless. The audience was shocked by this, and the expression that Margot Fontaine gave to her role as the male Tiresias in a woman's body, making love to a man. And so the ballet and the decors were well received in France and in the United States, but not in Britain, and um, it's never been staged since. Lambert died unexpectedly a few months later. Will Thorne's depression returned and she spent several months painting an attic room in the Hotel Lusian. Returning to London, she, she again found herself in a borrowed studio, this time from an old friend, the poet Dylan Thomas. The time spent with Giacometti had prompted her to rethink her portraits and one of her sitters was Thomas. Like Giacometti, I think this is the most Giacometti-esque of her works, actually. She treated the poet as a sort of single central figure and as a study in distance, um, or rather departure. Thomas died in New York um, the following autumn. Rawson left the city again permanently this time, with the composer Alan Rawson to her tiny cottage in rural Essex. Shortly afterwards, she built a large top-lit studio in her garden and added a glass room to the house for her to work in in summer and winter. Rawson's early pictures were sold or lost in her many moves, hidden before the occupation in Paris or bombed in London, and now she destroyed most of her recent work with the exception of Dylan Thomas. It was a new start and from the mid-1950s she had the opportunity to accumulate campaigns of work and store and preserve it. This was a third and major transformation in her career. She abandoned the seasons, although the theme would remain in her first Essex still lives, such as flowers in spring. They are painted in the glass room and they merge still life and landscape, interior and exterior, and, found, and featured exquisite, exquisitely painted um, vieux de pied containing flowers. To replace the nudes, Walsall used her connections with the ballet to gain access to moving figures, dancers in the practice room, a literal fugitive beauty. She, she travelled up to London regularly and then worked up her sketches at home. It was an inspired step. The mirrored rooms were another variation of her vitrine aesthetic, their frames, bars and floor markings providing a new scaffolding. She could observe a narrow repertoire of movements, repeated and reflected at all angles. Rawson covered sheets of paper with spontaneous notations. Her calligraphic mark took on a whole new life. Then she would combine them into paintings. Rawson was challenging her heroes. Giacometti had replaced the living effect of movement in his sculpture with what he called tension. 
He was, Rawson said, of the opinion that it was impossible to make a portrait in motion and that memory lasted one second. I do imagine Rodin would have agreed. Certainly Bacon does not agree. Her choice of words linked Giacometti's point of view to Rodin's famous statement about walking figures. The painter or the sculpture represents a transition from one pose to another. We will see a part of what was and we discover a part of what is to be. Wilson and Rodin said Rodin was uppermost in her mind when she first went to the rehearsal studios. She had um, studied his drawings since she was at art school. And her dancers were an opportunity to interrogate his model and Giacometti's. Wilson and Bacon were, I think, um, preempting or chiming with Merleau-Ponty's suggestion in The Eye and the Mind in 1961 that Rodin's idea could be bettered. And Rawson's proposal that it might, after all, be possible to transcend the split-second memory and make a portrait in motion, as she called them, paraphrased an alternative theory advanced in Paul Valéry's discussion of Degas' ballerinas in his book published in 1936, Degas' Dance de Saint. Valerie, by contrast, was convinced of the durability of the instantaneous element of memory. His argument focused on Degas' use of Edward Meyerbridge's stop-motion horse photographs, which he described as stepping like prima ballerina. Rawson reversed Valerie's anthropological view, likening dancers to animals. And where Bacon made use of Meyerbridge's photographs, her scrutiny of real people in repetitive routines, registering indications from bodies that were actually moving, were my bridges multiple explosions in life, sort of non-stop motion, if you like. So dancers, Nuri F. and Fontaine, painted around 1961, directly addressed Rodin and Giacometti's walking men, six of which Giacometti cast that year. They suggest movement in the Egyptian manner with both feet on the ground, a part of what was and a part of what will be. The right leg of Rawson's walking figure reads as both on and off the floor. The hips and head simultaneously suggest profile and turning away, while the leading arm elongates into future space. These optical paradoxes exploit the alternative model that Valerie called creative seeing. Working with the model, without the shortcut of photographs, Rawson stripped the body down more slowly than Bacon, and quintessence only arrived in time as a necessary anatomy was eliminated and spontaneity achieved in sinuous hints. Increasingly, multivalent lines simultaneously express contours and inner structure, muscle and flesh, movement and direction, and several of these at once, a kind of dynamic cubist calligraphy. After a period of study in Africa, the lines also took on a low relief textual quality, swipes and smears and scratches, a kind of gestural relievo shachiato. In ninth, this is one of, of six large oils um, uh, which were exhibited with other dancers at the Mulberg Gallery in 1968. Keith Roberts reviewed the exhibition in the Burlington Magazine. Against a background of thin, almost transparent swathes of paint, coagulations of pigment have been allowed to accumulate, like sand blown into drifts. The background shimmer and the spidery ridges take on the character of arms and legs glimpsed in motion, never still, as discernible, and yet as intangible as a dagger in Macbeth. Half the exhibition was devoted to Rawson's other project over these years, a rethinking of portraiture her heads, culminating in a series of double portraits of Alan Rawson. The Allens revisited and reversed the relation she had taken up with Giacometti. Rawson was her intimate lover and fellow artist. This was campaign was catalyzed in 1961 by her Nigerian experience. And in 1965, by seeing Giacometti's retrospective at the Tate Gallery, and in 1966 by his death, which she um, experience is catastrophic. The early portrait of Alan in a landscape on the far side here, um, for example, owes a debt to the, figure to the figure studies made in Zaria in Nigeria and to Giacometti's bust of, G of Diego, as well as to the Roman couple, you might have noticed. Giacometti asked how a represent representation of a head could avoid the horror of a cadaver, miserable debris to be thrown away, as he called it. 
and he reiterated the idea in an interview with David Sylvester in 1964, describing a head without vivacity as a dead object, an extremely unpleasant sort of object. I think the encrusted surfaces of Rawsthorne's reflected head of Alan Rawsthorne renders the face as just such material debris, but animated by ephemeral lightness. So Alan's presence is registered as action, momentary equivalents of form and shocks of familiar texture. And a photograph of the painting shows us just a scatter of shadows, and this is always a problem with Isabel's um, later work. But in front of it, we perceive varied forms and movements with our eyes and our skin. We feel as well as see the crepey fold of a lid, um, the bruised concavity around the inner eye, and the indents of the jowl and the smooth spreading flush of a pinkish cheek. Bacon was configuring strokes into different kinds of worlds in increasingly three-dimensional layerings. There is, an, and he sort of expressed it like this, there is an area of the nervous system um, to which the texture of paint communicates more violently than anything else. Where Bacon set off his embasto heads with smooth background planes of emulsion, the Allen series are placed in softly brushed spaces which extend Rawlsthorne's vitrine aesthetic. They accord with Merleau-Ponty's idea in the eye and the mind of painting finding equivalent for an immersive model of perception by which the body simultaneously experiences itself and others in the world. Unlike Giacometti or Bacon, Rawlsthorne was preoccupied with double portraits. It had this element of, of relationship. Um, and like her Romans, um, Alan is therefore rarely sol solitary. His presence is doubled and divided by his own reflection, his sister, friends, and in two cases, rare self-portraits of Rawlsthorne herself. In 1967, she reintroduced landscape into portraits and changed their shape from vertical to horizontal. This increased the distance between the figures significantly and gave greater emphasis to wine glasses, sometimes empty, sometimes spilled, often offering flowers. So here, uh, Narcisse and uh, Spit light the flowers in spring. View through a window one shows the couple facing each other like the other portraits, but in view through a window two, their backs are turned on each other. Isabel Rawlsthorne's vectored profile is reminiscent of Giacometti's second head, a cast of which she now had in her studio. And it's, it's sort of subtly represented in sort of sweeping strokes. Alan's face is literally double, simultaneously in profile and turned towards us. Set in the glass room again, overlooking fields, it is a very luminous painting and forms dissolve in pale greys laced with rainbow hues. Smoke from a burning house in the distance echoes the cigarette smoke which leaves the figure's mouths. And what at first appears to be a bird, on closer inspection, is an impasto concord, which was launched the same year. Like the glasses, sorry, oh, what's gone? Oh, I'm going the wrong way, sorry, I apologize. Like the glasses, Concord was a motive of accord and the couple's cherished Anglo-French lifestyle and one of leaving, emphasized by the concentric rings of the sonic boom. Proximity and remoteness, recognition and strangeness stand in for proximities and distances of a psychological kind. Rawlston was 59 when she lost Alan four years later in 1971. She asked the sculpture and friend Roy Noakes to go to the hospital and make a death mask, which contributed to her last head of Alan. The small canvas is, is at the same time um, unsentimental and very tender. It has the greatest embodied presence of any of Rawlsthorne's works, far more about touch than about vision. The rectangle is filled with a hair just less than life size, as it appears when you look down at it from a few feet above. And with an unbelievably moving poetry, the face, the shade of the white pillow behind, is visible only in the shadows created by its scarified texture, the actions in the paint. It is subtly anamorphic, looking wrong upright, 
but the shadows and the point of view only resolve when the picture is held flat in the hands. Before the Marlborough exhibition was over, Rawson was involved in a new project, um, landscape and a return to her seasons. She created seven more large canvases in portrait format at this time called Migrations. They transmuted her contemplations of life and death and the fugitive nature of perception into images of environmental change. In particular, she reflected her new interest in, the, in ecology um, of Rachel, Rachel Carson and uh, her involvement in early conservation organizations such as Fauna and Flora. Her turn to luminous yellow and blue, a nod to the gold and blue of medieval books of hours, registered two particular events. Rawlstone's failing sight and the appearance at the end of the 1960s of sudden yellow fields of flowering canola. They were the recent and most visible symptom of the industrial, sometimes dysfunctional farming practices that have followed the shortages of the war. And this is the view from Rawlstone's glass room. In the migration pictures, we find the missile thrushes, hawksweed, cranesbill, and wild roses of the local hedgerows, departing swallows and, and hawks that prey. We also see nature depleted and displaced, a dead crow, land gulls, swallows held in the hand while they are ringed for research. Continuity and extinction are references in, referenced in skeletal pterosaur forms scratched into the yellow paint like fossils. Rawson observed the birds in the wild and in the hand and acquaintances or cats bought carcasses that she could study. Decomposing bodies littered her workplace as they had in the 1940s. But now she adapted her consummate um, technique to the character of each creature. So whether they're mere flicks of disappearance in the distance or captured between curled fingers, arrows flying, flattened cadavers or fragments of buried bone, the, girls, the, the birds were animated by a newly vivacious draftsmanship and a sense of transience created by the uncertainty of view, the viewer's eye, unable to quite catch what it sees. In several of the canvases, Rawlstone introduced her own hand holding a swallow as she would when she was ringing it. The sunlight circles, especially the golden disc in Migration 5, returns us to Cassandra's invocation to Apollo. The swallow held against the glowing disc recalls Turner's angel in, in, in the sun. The distillation of the idea of artistic inspiration into a bird caught temporarily in the hand within the yellow round is an exquisite example of, of Isabel's quintessence. For all its poetic play, it is a literal representation of both the bird and the embodied condition under which the artist fleetingly encounters it. Its shape and orientation contain something of the appearance of a charcoal or brush held above the picture as it is made. So more than a metaphor for inspiration, inspiration it is an actual capturing of life as they flutter and touch is traced in the extraordinary vivacious smears and pricks and touches and dabs. And I'm just going to go back to this one because this is my favorite of all the hands. So to conclude, Ross Thorne's mature figures, portraits and landscapes achieved the embodied art that she had been researching since Liverpool. In some notes for an exhibition catalogue in 1986, she wrote, I am beginning to understand what pushes me into painting. No, she just says beginning. The love of seeing and the fact that as the chosen object grows in beauty, so does it become more elusive. And this later, fugitive beauty in terms of technique as well as motif I think is her Cassandrian language at once ambiguous and, and raw. <laughs>